Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bona fide culture and politics TV talk show. Tonight, let's talk about provincial politics and let's discuss how big political parties can stay united in very polarizing times. Let's also talk about crime in BC and Premier David Eby's catch and release policies. And speaking of David Eby, is there anything that maybe he should have done in his first 100 days as BC's Premier? Returning to the program to discuss all of this, our guest tonight is the leader of BC's official opposition party, the BC Liberals, soon to be BC United. He is Kevin Falcon. Kevin, a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thanks. It's great to be here, Mo. Look at us doing this again. Who I know. Thought, We're bringing, right? bringing everyone together. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. A lot has happened since June when we last spoke. Yes. New premier. Your party is on the verge of a new name. One of the more concerning things is this increasing polarization, particularly on a federal level, mm -hmm. between federal conservatives and federal liberals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really should be concerning for you because historically your party has drawn from federal liberals and federal conservatives as a voter base, and then also people who make up your caucus. Definitely. So as, as the BC liberals become BC United, just how united is your party? I, I think it's pretty united, to be honest, because I'll tell you why. Um, most people don't belong to political parties. So, you know, it may surprise people out there, but like 95% of the public don't belong to liberals, conservatives, NDP, Greens, nothing. They're just regular people going about their business. And I think what they're looking for are just good ideas that make sense. Right. And, you know, so could some people that belong to either of those federal parties be upset with me at one time or another? For sure, they will be. I have no doubt about that. But I just focus on trying to have big, bold ideas that can resonate with a broad, you know, swath of the public. And, you know, some people at either end of the fringe might say, well, I disagree with that. I can't believe he's doing that or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, I think that most people, when it comes time to vote, say, you know, I don't agree with everything he says, but I think on the big issues, he's got it right. That's good enough for me. But I think when we look at this polarization, it's not necessarily even about political party membership. There seems to be this culture war element and, <clears throat> and a fundamental disagreement on certain values. So mm -hmm. does that worry you when you're trying to bring people together that may look at certain issues, whether it's the environment or social issues, very differently? Well, it's actually one of the reasons that brought me back to politics, to be honest with you, because as you know, Mo, I was, you know, uh, safely ensconced in the private sector and there was no <laughs> great reason for me to come back except for the same reason I left, which was my kids. I've mm -hmm. got two daughters that are 13 and 10. I care a lot about their future. And I was very concerned about what I was seeing in politics writ large in North America with Trump and sort of the racism, both blatant and subtle and all the kind of nastiness that I was seeing out there. And I just think it's really important that people in public life, we can we can disagree on lots of things for sure. And, and you know, there's nobody that's going to be harder on the policies and the platform than myself. But but on the other hand, we can do it in an agreeable way. We can be disagreeable agreeably. And, and so that's something that I don't want to get lost in all this, because that's where a lot of the anger, you know, we people that disagree with me are not my enemy. They're just people that disagree. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just think we have to find ways to kind of bring people together as much as we can. Sure. Now, within your own caucus, you've had several controversies, and I would call them minor controversies, but yeah. you've had an MLA speaking out against safe injection sites. You've had MLA supporting the Freedom Convoy. Yeah. You've had an MLA that completely blames inflation on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And I was actually there when longstanding BC Liberal MLA, Mike DeYoung, endorsed Pierre Polyev. And yeah. one of Pierre Polyev's key, you know, platform planks is scrapping the carbon tax, yeah. which your party <laughs> proudly wears as the, yeah. as the party that brought it in. Yeah. So when I look at those controversies or people in your caucus speaking out of school, perhaps, is it an issue of party discipline or has the party just not coalesced around shared values yet? No, I think it's really, this is very, it's such a good question. And, and it's important for your viewers to understand this. Look, I think it's very important that people have to understand we're a party, not a cult. That means that we don't just, you know, agree on everything mm -hmm. all the time. And I don't frankly want to be around a bunch of people that are just, you know, oh, yes, Kevin, yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> like, that's not healthy either, right? We have to find space in our political system where strong-minded people can have differing opinions, uh, but still work together for the greater common good. 
And so, you know, I don't get too bent out of shape for, you know, people within my caucus having differing, uh, differing opinions on issues. You know, I've got people that are very strong federal liberal supporters, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's lots that them and I can agree on. I've also got people that are strong federal conservative supporters, and I've got some that are strong green supporters. And all of us together can agree on enough that provincially I think we can, you know, focus on trying to make things better. So there are going to be some people who are, say, perhaps conservative minded and they're mm -hmm. going to say, hey, this party actually supports, you know, the carbon tax. This party does allow for harm reduction when it comes to mental health and addictions. Is there space within your party for conservative views, mainstream conservative views espoused by, you know, the federal conservatives? Oh, very much so. So let's talk carbon tax, for example. So, you know, I was part of the government, very proud to have brought in North America's first revenue neutral carbon tax which the NDP bitterly opposed, as you recall. We mm -hmm. fought an election campaign in 2009 on that very issue. And we took a lot of slings and arrows from a lot of conservative supporters, I might add. But most conservatives and most, frankly, most people supported it because of the revenue neutral part of it, meaning that every dollar collected had to be returned to the form of lower personal income taxes or lower small business taxes. So it was a tax shift, mm -hmm. not a tax grab. Now, subsequently, the NDP have turned it into a tax grab. They've said, no, we don't like this, you know, giving it back to people people bit. So they took it all into government. But but I would argue to conservatives, that is the right thing to do. It's, it's a market response to dealing with something. You price it, you make sure there's a cost associated with it, but you don't turn it into something where government's just greedily taking in that money. They're mm -hmm. returning it to you in other ways. So you pay more here, but you get more back over there. And I think that's the right way to do things. And, and so, you know, is that liberal? Is it conservative? I don't know. I just think it's smart <laughs> policy. And most people, mm -hmm. I think, came around and said, you know what? That is smart policy. Sure. And that's why we won the 2009 election. Yeah. And and that's fair enough. I, I, I guess I'm just saying, how do you as a party or as a leader adapt to people wanting to, particularly on social media, mm -hmm. trying to put you into a box? You know, are yeah. you a liberal? Are you a conservative? Yeah. I asked David Eby the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. how, how do you reach out to those folks that are very vocal and, and sometimes can have influence over where the dialogue is. Well, you know, I always say to people, just, you know, look look at my past. If there's one thing people need to know about me, I make decisions based on evidence. And I don't care what the, you know, the blowback's going to be. So when I first supported supervised injection sites, the conservative government of Stephen Harper actually sued us as a government, mm -hmm. said, you know, wanting to shut them down. But the reason I supported them at the time is because I wanted to see the evidence. Could these actually help people get transitioned to, you know, getting the services they need so they can get off their addictions? Um, you know, here I am many, many years later, and I honestly will tell you, I think government's lost the plot when it comes to so-called safe injection sites, because many of them no longer have any nurses available. It's not about connecting people to services to help them at a moment of lucidity where you can talk to them and say, look, we've got some supports to help you get off your addiction. Um, and it's just become no longer a supervised injection site, but a safe injection site. Mm. And so I, you know, that worries me because I don't think we're following evidence anymore. So if there's one thing you need to know about me, I just care about evidence and doing the right thing regardless of where it takes you. Well, I can appreciate that. And you know that I have many more questions for you after oh, yeah. the commercial break. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, sit tight, because after some business, let's talk about violent crime throughout BC. What policies have gotten us here, and what can be done about it? Kevin Falcon shares his thoughts up next. Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir. And of course, we're still here with our featured guest for the entire show tonight. He is the leader of the BC Liberals, soon to be BC United. He is Kevin Falcon. Kevin, you didn't run away. You stuck around. I stuck around. Thank I lo you. <laughs> love it. <laughs> crime and violent crime yeah. in particular is a big issue mm -hmm. throughout the province, whether it's Vancouver, Victoria, Victoria even Terrace. Mm -hmm. You know, you see communities worried about this. Mm -hmm. Your party has really gone on the offensive and blamed David Eby and yeah. his quote unquote uh, soft on crime policies, his catch and release policies. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what exactly are those policies? What has David Eby done to make crime worse in BC? Sure. So he was the, it's important for your listeners to understand this. So David Eby, prior to becoming premier, was the attorney general for five and a half years, mm -hmm. virtually the entire time the NDP have been in government. And during that time, we have seen an explosion, frankly, of crime and social chaos and disorder in communities right across the province. And one of the things we have seen under his term as attorney general is a 75% increase in what are called 
no charge assessments, meaning that the prosecutors, the police have arrested somebody, they've recommended charges, and the provincial crown has said, no, we're not going to charge them. And they get released back into the community. That's part of what we call catch and release. And the problem with that is many of these offenders are very highly prolific offenders that, that cause a huge amount of social chaos and disorder. And so when we brought this up, as soon as I became leader a year ago, because I was in the private sector too for 10 years, and I saw the community, especially in Vancouver, getting worse and worse every single year. And I'm like, what is going on? And so when I got there, we started asking these questions and he denied it. He said it's anecdotal. You know, it's just rhetoric from the BC Liberals. And yet we were hearing from people every day and the police, the Vancouver police came out and said, four people a day in Vancouver are being attacked by random strangers. Four. And that's not just like pushing someone. That's like machete attacks, mm -hmm. stabbings, people, young uh, Asian woman hit over the head with a bar, a metal bar. And but this, but this phenomenon, while absolutely concerning, yeah. can you link it to anything that David Eby passed in, in the legislature? Like you you're, you called it his policies. Yeah, so I'm no, curious what the policies well, are. Well, the policies are that he's given direction to Crown to be lax on how they deal with repeat uh, prolific offenders. And what we have said is you can change that. You can give specific direction to Crown that essentially says when you have to make a decision about releasing someone back to society, the interest of public safety must take priority over the interest of that individual to be released back into the public. Right. And he refuses to do that. To this very day, we had a former Attorney General Mike DeYoung actually write it for him and present it to him in the House. He still refused to do it. And, you know, we had all the mayors of the major urban centers, including mm -hmm. Vancouver, who at that time had an NDP mayor that wrote to him because he had also told them, show me the evidence. I don't believe it. And the mayor of Vancouver pointed out that there were 40 individuals, that's 4-0, that were, had... Uh, 6,385 negative interactions with the police last year alone. Imagine that, 40 people. In in uh, Kelowna, there was 15 individuals arrested over a thousand times in one year. So it is clearly a problem, but he refuses to deal with it. I don't know if it's because his history with Pivot Legal Society, you know, he wrote the manual, How to Sue the Police. I, I, I frankly just think that he's kind of got an anti-policing mentality, but how it's hurting the public. This, though, but how much of this is a national issue? Because we see the same issues in Toronto, in um, Edmonton and Winnipeg. I even I was even reading the other day that Halifax has seen unprecedented gun violence. And so I when I talked to Premier Eby, who was not the premier at the time, you know, he said that, you know, you have to look at federal bail reform or uh, issues in the criminal justice system processes during COVID that led to a lot of uh, people being released or were not in prison or not in jail. So how much of this is actually just a national issue as okay. opposed to you know, being his fault specifically. So, so there is a federal element of responsibility here too, because they did pass a bill federally that uh, really um, uh, weakened the provisions around bail and essentially said to the provinces, because it's national in scope, uh, you know, wherever possible, make sure you're providing bail as opposed to detaining someone. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, here's the problem though. The NDP said yes, and you see, uh, we voted against it because, now this is interesting, the former Attorney General, after David E. We ran for leader, was a, a gentleman named Murray Rankin. Mm -hmm. And Murray happened to be a federal member of parliament when that bill was being debated and passed in the federal parliament. And yes, indeed, it turned out he had voted against it, but the reason was he didn't think it went far enough. It wasn't lenient enough on criminals. <laughs> so for the NDP here today to try and pretend that somehow, you know, they are, are, are in support of trying to toughen up some of those provisions really doesn't ring very true when we saw what they actually did in Ottawa. Yeah. So, so I just think, look, there's some common sense elements. Obviously, you don't just lock people up. I'm not one of these people that's simplistic that way. But there are people, a small group, admittedly, that you do need to lock up because they are a danger to society. And, you know, when they're pushing over 93-year-old gentlemen in, in Chinatown and breaking hips and, and young women with, with kids in strollers being attacked by strangers throwing bottles at their children and stuff, like this is a serious problem. So what I've said is, first of all, the, uh, yes, uh, rewrite the the direction to Crown to make sure that they understand that violent, prolific offenders, keep them behind bars, frankly, until they go before the judge. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, we've said that there's a mental health and addiction element to this too. And that's why a month ago we brought out our policy called Better is Possible, which said we're going to move dramatically away from what the NDP are doing, which is just a total focus on publicly supplied addictive drugs and decriminalization of hard drugs like fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, without the proper guardrails being in place. And because we believe that our primary obligation should be helping those that struggle with addiction to get off of their addiction. So treatment and recovery, make it free, and make sure we have coverage right across the province. That sure. was our shift. I guess, and really quickly, 
when we think about the context of federal bail reform and things that have happened on a national level, is the province even capable of doing things so that prolific offenders are, you know, either behind bars or people that need treatment? Yes. Oh, okay. A hard yes on that. But they're also capable of lobbying loud and hard to the federal governments to say, you know what, you went too far on that bail reform. We need you to fix it. Now, they quietly talk about how they're having conversations. No, say it loudly and up front in front of your friends from the Pivot Legal and all the other groups that supported David Eby and be up front about the fact that repeat violent offenders should be kept in jail. <laughs> Fair enough, Kevin. I appreciate that answer. And I have a question for you sure. up next about what you would do if you were premier. Great. <laughs> Folks, stick around because after some business, Kevin Falcon is going to step out of his role as the leader of the official opposition and for a brief moment, step into the role of premier. And he's going to tell us what the first hundred days of a Kevin Falcon led BC government would look like. Up next. Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir. Now, over the weekend, BC Premier David Eby marked his first 100 days in office as Premier. And over that time, he's made many large announcements. And while we've heard a lot of criticism from the official opposition, BC Liberals, I'm left wondering what their leader would do differently. Of course, he's here to give us his thoughts. So let's ask him. He is, of course, Kevin Falcon. Kevin. Thanks for sticking around. It's been a great show so yeah. far. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I feel like I've it. learned a lot too. Oh, good. I'm glad, yeah. So I think when you're in opposition, mm -hmm. you know, your job is just to criticize and ask and, and make the government accountable for any decisions they make. Yeah. And you're not really responsible for a full platform until maybe right. you get to election period. Mm -hmm. But I know you're a thoughtful guy, so I'm curious, if you were premier tomorrow, what would your first 100 days look like? Yeah. And, and how would it be different than David Eby's? Sure. So first of all, it would be so different in the sense that uh, I wouldn't just make a bunch of announcements. And I really think it's important for your listeners to know this. Um, government isn't just about making announcements. That's what they're trying to make it seem like, uh, you know, $500 million here, $100 million there, $20 million there. It, what the public really has to understand are what results are we actually getting from government? Mm -hmm. This is very important. Uh, if you look at healthcare, for example, we've, you know, one in five British Columbians can access a family doctor. We've got a million British Columbians waiting to see a specialist. Yeah. We've got the worst cancer care in the country. We used to be the best in North America. Um, so those are really bad outcomes. You look at housing. We've ended up after two terms of NDP government with the most unaffordable housing in North America, not just in Canada, North America. We've ended up with rents, the highest rents in Canada. Um, they promised 112,000 affordable housing units. They haven't even built a fraction of those. And they're already six years into the 10-year plan. They built 12,000 of the 114,000, I think it was, that they originally promised. So those are really, really bad results. And, and so what the public has to understand is going out and making announcements is almost meaningless. We have to judge government on what results we're getting. And so what I would say to British Columbians is, first of all, I'm not going to try and sucker you to pretend that a bunch of announcements in 100 days is going to somehow you know change the world. What I will say to you is that when we make public policy decisions, they're going to be bold, they will be sweeping, and they will be uh, very transparent because I want to be held accountable to the to results. So we will make sure the data is very transparent so the public can see exactly whether we're getting better results or worse results because I want to know that. You know, in the business community, if you go and make a bunch of announcements but your results get worse and worse, you'll get fired. None of these people get fired. They just keep doing on <laughs> more of the same thing, expecting different results. And right. it doesn't work out that way. I will say one thing, though, one specific commitment I would make for sure uh, would be part of what I announced uh, our, our mental health and addictions plan, Better as Possible, that on day one, there would be no cost associated for those that are seeking treatment for addiction recovery, because I do not want cost to ever be a barrier for those that are trying to get off of substance abuse. Now, it's not my job to defend the BC NDP government yeah. over its tenure by any means, but specifically when it comes to David Eby, he has had a lot of announcements over the, the last 100 days, or I should say his first 100 days as premier. Mm -hmm. But when you're put into that role, the first 100 days, isn't that just a lot of announcements anyway? Like, it's not like you're going to see substantive action on the ground immediately, right? Like, if, if you were to become premier, I can't go to you and say, hey, housing's still unaffordable, yeah. or, you know, I still don't have a family doctor. Like, these things do take time, don't they? Yeah, but here's the, the concern I have is that the announcements he's made, you can tell, have been so rushed 
that there's no details or any information behind them hmm. because they actually haven't figured out what exactly they're doing. I'll use mental health and addictions as an example. So when we made our announcement a month ago, uh, uh, better is possible, we had such positive feedback from such a widespread you know, group of British Columbians and, and doctors and people, experts in the field, that apparently it caused some panic in government. And two weeks before this budget, they put through in Treasury Board a billion dollars that they're going to announce in the budget towards treatment and recovery. Now, look, I'm going to take your plan. Isn't no, that a good thing? I, no, listen, and You're I'm an okay with that. Leader. No, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> and, and I'm okay with that. But the finance minister, because I've been a finance minister before, part of me is just horrified to think that, that in two weeks, they, they will just make a billion dollar decision, clearly without any thought to it. There's been no work being done on it. And they're unprepared. So I, I worry about that because we may actually get really bad results out of those dollars being spent because that's not a direction they've ever gone. But I, I applaud right. them for spending the money if it's going to treatment and recovery and not just more of the publicly supplied addictive drugs. Well, I'm sure that in the coming months, coming years before an election, I don't think we'll have an election this year, but I'm sure we'll get more policy from you. And it will yes. be interesting to see how it affects the, the governing BC Liberals for sure. and, and uh, Premier David Eby. Kevin, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time tonight, and I look forward to doing it again. Well, thank you, Mo. I really appreciate it. It's Absolutely. been great. Absolutely. Right. Folks, that's it for tonight's show. Of course, what a fantastic guest, the leader of BC's official opposition, the man who hopes to be the next premier of British Columbia, Kevin Falcon. Now, if you're looking for more This Is Van Color, including full episodes and bonus content, find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Czech Media's YouTube channel, and the Check Plus app. But for now, this is Van Color and I'm Mo Amir telling you that in a province where you can be anything, be colorful. Peace. <laughs>